starts 3.5 billion years ago with the first ever living organism, a unicellular, chemosynthetic, anaerobic bacteria, or rather, a single cell that gets its energy from inorganic chemical reactions and does not require oxygen. This organism is believed to be the common ancestor for all other organisms, including us. For this reason, all organisms, whether they be plant, bacteria, fungi, animal, share DNA. So before I explain to you the benefits of biotechnology and genetically modified organisms, GMOs, I first need to explain to you the concept of DNA and mutations. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and as seen in this diagram, forms a double helix. The backbone is made from deoxyribose sugar and phosphorus, and the ladder-like structure is formed from nitrogenous bases. Now, these nitrogenous bases are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Regardless of the organism, the basic structure of DNA remains the same. The only thing that changes is the sequence and length of these nitrogenous bases. This is how the creation of GMOs is possible. So remember how I said that we all evolved from an organism that existed 3.5 billion years ago? I'm sure many of you are wondering how this is the case. To cut a long story short, mutations, or changes in the order of these nitrogenous bases. Now, mutations often get a bad rep, and in all fairness, there's some pretty awful mutations out there, like the mutation that led to the UK strain of the coronavirus, which is said to be 70% more infectious, or mutations that occur in our cells that can lead to cancers. But not all mutations are bad. In fact, if we look at the mutation that occurred in COVID-19, it is actually a beneficial mutation. Certainly not for us, but it is for the survival of the virus. <laughs> Another example of a beneficial mutation is lactose tolerance. Lactose tolerance is actually caused by a mutation in our cells that allows people to digest lactase sugar in dairy. Now, this mutation occurred so long ago that it's now thought of as like a normal trait in Western society, but it is actually caused by a mutation. So now let's bring it back to the concept of biotechnology and GMOs. Most people are afraid of GMOs, and rightfully so. If used incorrectly, they have the power to be detrimental to both our body and our environment. However, if used correctly, they have the power to benefit our environment, our agriculture, our health, and our overall medicine. So now I'd like to pose a question. Is it ethical to take a piece of DNA from one organism and place it in another organism's gene sequence? Create a GMO. I grew up in a small country town called Pladeliac in France. There were six kids in my year at school and maybe about 50 in the whole school. Much of the town's economy was driven by the farming industry. So I understand how vital farming is for many communities. However, modern day farming techniques can have a detrimental impact on our environment. The chemicals used in pesticides, herbicides and fungicides lead to an increase in phosphorus levels in our waterways. This, in turn, increases the algae bloom and the amount of phosphosynthetic bacteria on the surface of the water. This decreases the amount of organisms living in the water and increases coral bleaching. What's more is these chemicals are digested when we eat our foods. So we eat these chemicals, they're inside us as well. Another detrimental impact is the fact that when we eat these chemicals, it impacts our DNA and causes mutations. The National Cancer Institute and the President's Cancer Panel found that girls exposed to DDT before puberty are five times more likely to develop breast cancer. On top of this, people who tested by the Centre of Disease Control and Prevention showed that 99% of people had remnants of DDT in their blood. On top of this, there are many other chemicals in the herbicides and pesticides and fungicides that have caused increase in miscarriage, decrease in fertility and decrease in birth weights. So, the environmental impacts are destroying our planet, but we also have to look at the impacts on our environment, which are causing an increase in disease in both us and other species. So, instead of allowing chemicals to act as uncontrolled mutagens in, mutagens in our bodies, why not genetically engineer plants to have resistance to pests? <coughs> Stem rust disease is a disease in wheat plants which has developed a resistance to fungicide. For this reason, no amount of um, fungicide can prevent the disease. Flax plants, however, have developed a natural resistance to the disease. And so the stem rust resistant genes can be taken from the flax plants and inserted into the wheat plants, hence giving them resistance as well, eradicating the need for fungicides in the first place and the consequences that these have on our environment and bodies. <laughs> Another detrimental impact of farming is seen in the breeding of animals in large numbers. 
Now, not only do these animals require land, but their food requires land. This causes habitat fragmentation, putting species in the natural environment in very small, restricted areas with limited resources, and this causes a fight for survival and increases their risk of extinction. Another example is seen in pigs. They release copious amounts of phosphorus in their manure. However, scientists have been able to genetically engineer environmentally friendly pigs, which release 65% less phosphorus in their manure. These pigs have been implanted with E. coli genes, which produce the enzyme phytase, so as the pig chews, it breaks down the phosphorus in their feed. Now, because the enzymes are expressed specifically in the pig's salivary glands, there is no safety concern with the actual meat. What's more is that they have the same nutritional benefit and require less feed, according to studies, as natural pigs. So, if monitored and tested, biotechnology has the ability to solve problems that are destroying our planet, from algae bloom to coral bleaching to extinction of entire species due to habitat fragmentation. On top of these environmental impacts lies the health burden to both humans and other animals, which has seen an increase in disease and decrease in fertility. So why not allow biotechnology to solve these problems? A further application of biotechnology is in the minimization of malnutrition. According to the World Health Organization, 45% of deaths among children under the age of five are linked to undernutrition. 842 million people worldwide are undernourished, with 2 billion suffering from hidden hunger, which is caused by not eating a balanced diet. Malnutrition is a global issue, and as seen in the case of hidden hunger, it is not always linked to not having access to foods, rather not having access to healthy foods, or in some cases, being unable to effectively digest foods due to disease. Rice is the staple food for more than half of the world's population, and scientists have been able to genetically engineer rice to have higher levels of nutrients, such as protein, vitamin A, and iron. This, gold, this rice has been named golden rice due to its yellow colour. Golden rice has been modified to produce the compound B-cartonine, which in our bodies is transferred into vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiency can lead to skin irritation, increased susceptibility to disease, and hair loss. On top of this, it is a large contributor to blindness in developing countries. Yes, malnutrition targets poverty-stricken countries, but it is not localised to these areas. In fact, Australian dietitians have coined it the silent epidemic, with approximately 39% of patients in Australian hospitals being undernourished, and a further 32 to 72% being undernourished in our aged care facilities. These people are already vulnerable. They are in our hospitals and aged care homes to be looked after, not to have their needs ignored. So we need to change the way that we're doing things. If we genetically enhance foods to have high levels of nutrients, then there's no need to take vitamin supplements or vitamin gummies. And so it eradicates that need to take a rainbow of pills every morning. Instead, you're just eating foods that are healthier and more beneficial for you and the environment and other species. Often people ask me why I want to be a doctor. And to be honest with you, there is no one reason. However, my biggest motivation would have to be a consequence of the experiences that my family and I have survived. When I was 13, my mum was diagnosed with cervical cancer. This photo was taken just before she started treatment. Now, the months that followed her diagnosis were by far the toughest time of my life. My mum's treatment left her bedridden, and the side effects of her treatment altered her life. Due to the radiation and the scar tissue left by it, she suffers from persistent and recurring UTIs. The chemotherapy has significantly decreased her memory to the point where she forgets where she is in conversations and even completely forgets conversations. Now, these are just two of a long list of side effects that my mum suffers. It is true that these drugs saved her life. However, I often wonder how much of her life they didn't save, how much of her life was sacrificed along with the cancer cells. Now, cancer is the result of a mutation in one's cells that prevents them from being unable to go, undergo apoptosis programmed cell death. So, the mutated cells grow and replicate at an exponential rate and do not die. For this reason, mutations and tumours occur. So, in the past, chemotherapy, radiation and surgery are used to treat cancer patients, but all, that's for almost all patients. And my mum's cancer, for example, is quite a rare form of cancer. In fact, only 1.4% of cancer diagnoses last year were cervical cancer. The other large percent makes up a long list of other cancers found in both humans and other species. So how is it we treat them in just these three ways? Well, we kill all of the cells around the cancer, not just the cancer cells.
Needless to say, many patients suffer from the same long-term and short-term effects as my mum did. However, there have been some exciting developments in biotechnology by companies such as Anjum, which has shown promising results for cancer patients. Now, cancer tricks our immune system into not attacking it, just as it wouldn't attack normal, healthy cells. However, scientists have been able to undergo immunotherapy research, where they're researching how they can teach our immune system to fight cancer cells while leaving our normal, healthy cells alone. Furthermore, through the gene sequencing, scientists have been able to identify the exact mutation that led to a patient's specific cancer. Through doing this, they're then able to find the immune cells that are specific to said patient's cancer mutation, grow them in a lab, replicate them, and then insert them back into the patient as personalised precision therapy. On top of this, scientists have been able to identify that a particular protein called CRAS is linked to cancer development. Now, because scientists have been able to identify this protein, they now hope that through biotechnology, they'll be able to switch it off. What's more is T-cells in our immune system are already being taught how to fight our cancer cells and destroy them while leaving normal healthy cells alone. But of course, cancer and malnutrition are just two of the countless diseases that biotechnology can help solve. In fact, the possibilities are almost endless. There's already biotechnology being able to cure cystic fibrosis, AIDS and muscular dystrophy through CRISPR technology. And then technology such as gene sequencing is helping to find cures for diabetes. So if there was one thing I learned during my mum's battle with cancer, it is that hope is the only thing stronger than fear. Hope for a better future. Hope for a future where our planet is safe for all species to inhabit. Hope for a future where people have access to the foods that they need. Hope for a future where disease has less power over the people it plagues. Hope for biotechnology and all the problems it can solve, solutions it already offers. Hope, not fear. So as I stand in front of you today, I'd like to ask you again. Is it ethical to take a piece of DNA from one organism and place it into another organism's gene sequence? Is it ethical to offer hope?